question for you. How many of you have a dad or a grandfather who loves to tell stories? All right. So a lot of us, all right, we're sort of familiar with that. And, and uh, how many of you would say they like to tell those stories often? Like the same stories. Are you, are you there and you, you just kind of have to go along and listen and pretend like you're hearing it for the first time, right? And uh, sometimes, um, sometimes those, you know, sometimes it seems difficult because we've heard those stories so many times. But I, I do want to encourage you, those stories are something that you will treasure one day. This is my grandfather. Uh, he's 97 years old. I believe he's 96 when that, I think it was his first selfie. So, um, <laughs> but um, he, he, uh, he has some great stories. And one of the neat things is even just getting to visit with him uh, over the last couple of years is uh, I've gotten to hear some stories that I had never even heard and never even known. And uh, he had told one of them, uh, he was a farmer. Uh, they farmed in southern New Jersey. And uh, he told a story about how his, da his dad uh, they would take produce to an auction in Philadelphia, of course, by horse and wagon. And they would get back late at night, but the horses knew the way home. And so his dad would actually go to sleep on the wagon, and the horses would go home from Philadelphia all the way to South Jersey by themselves. And he said only one time they ended up at a different farm. So, um, <laughs> but those stories are precious. Now, I want us to, for a moment, imagine that you are Solomon. Now, I'm, I'm not positive this is an actual picture of Solomon, but I googled it, and so, you know, it's on the internet, so. But let's just pretend uh, this is Solomon. So, for a moment, I want you to imagine that you're Solomon. Now, ladies, I know this may be a little bit more difficult for you, right? But just, just go with it, all right? So let's just imagine that you're Solomon, King Solomon of Israel. Now, who's your daddy? David. Now, can you imagine what it would have been like to have David as your father? Now, granted, there were some real family issues there, but that aside, it still would have been pretty cool to uh, have David as a father, right? And think about the stories that you would have heard. And can you imagine the stories that, that Solomon have got to hear about? Hey, Dad, tell me again about that time you killed the lion. You know, tell me that time about you. Man, tell me, you, what was it like to kill Goliath? You know what, man, and, and I'm sure David told that story. Maybe he talked about his military conquests or, you know, maybe talked about what it was like to play the harp for, for Saul and have a javelin thrown at you and dodge it twice. And, you know, I'm sure he animated the story well. And he's like, yeah, I just whoop, you know, like that. <laughs> javelin went right on by, you know. So David heard some, I mean, Solomon heard some, some really, really great stories. And, and, and these stories... I'm sure, no doubt, impacted his, his life. And I want us to consider one of those stories this morning and then look at some of the wisdom that I believe that, that from that he gleaned and then shared with us. So if you have your Bible, we're, I'm going to just highlight some of 1 Samuel chapter 24. Uh, because of time constraints, we're not going to read all of it this morning. But in 1 Samuel chapter 24, um, we find one of the stories that Solomon may have heard his dad tell. And it's a pretty good story. Uh, this chapter in 1 Samuel 24, we find a period of David's life where David has been anointed as the next king of Israel, but Saul is still king. And you can imagine if you're Saul and you're king and somebody else has been anointed to be king and it's not someone from your family, because normally you sort of pass that down in the family. Are you with me? How do you think Saul felt about David? Some of you know. Do you think he had warm, good thoughts about, about David or not so much? Not so much. All right, especially because David was getting very, very popular. And so because of that, Saul decides he needs to kill David. And so this is a period of, of David's life where David is on the run. Right? He's living out in the wilderness. He's moved from place to place because Saul has decided and determined to kill him. And in 1 Samuel 24, uh, we were going to find out, and if you take some time to read through this story later too, you'll find out that, uh, David is in a place called En Gedi. All right? It's an oasis where there's a spring. It's near the Dead Sea. And he's hiding out there. And Saul gets word that David is there. And so Saul takes 3,000 of his best men, of his best soldiers, right? and he sets out on a mission to kill David. All right? And so that happens that as they are nearing En Gedi, as they're nearing that place, that Saul needed to go to the bathroom. All right? Happens to everyone. All right? You with me? So Saul goes into a cave because there were no porta potties, all right? 
And so Saul goes into a cave to relieve himself, the Bible says. And while he goes in there, this is where the irony comes in. David and his men are hiding in that very same cave. And Saul goes in and of course his attendants are out at the front of the cave, but they leave him alone. And so David's men, they, they, they sense that this, this is it. God has given your enemy into your hands, David. Go kill him. Right? This, I mean, and how many of you say, if somebody's trying to kill me, like, then I'd be really tempted to kill them, right? You with me? All right? And so they say, go kill him. And, and so David begins to sneak up on Saul. All right? Can, it's, man, it had to be weird, you know? Are, are you with me? But he sneaks up on Saul, and he's got, he's got a knife in his hand. Right? And you know his men are like, you know, can you imagine his men? Like, they're just rooting for him. Like, he's going to kill him. He's going to do it. And then he just cuts off a piece of his robe and crawls back. And the guys were like, duh. Because their lives were in just as much danger as David's life. Like, this was a life or death thing, right? This, I mean, they didn't want him to just kill Saul for the sport of it. They were, they were on the run for their lives as well. And David chooses not to do that. And this story gets even better because after that, David walks out of the cave while Saul and his men are still in the area. And he calls out to Saul. And then it says he, he bows before him. And then he, then he talks to him and he, he, he basically he holds up the piece of the robe and he says, he says, Saul, why are you trying to kill me? Right? Because I'm not trying to kill you. In fact, I had the chance to kill you. And I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And of course, then Saul becomes emotional and, and, and he's like, oh, oh, you're so honorable and you're so great and I'm so sorry for trying to kill you. Right? And I feel so bad about that. And, and so Saul went home and then later on he tried to kill him again, right? <laughs> but this would have been one of the stories that I believe that, that Solomon would have heard his dad tell. And the stories that we hear from our parents, from our grandparents, from other people, they impact our lives. And Solomon will, of course, go on to become king of Israel. And at the beginning of, of his reign, right, he is going to ask God for what? What does he ask God for? Wisdom. All right, God appears to him in a dream and, and, and God gives him an offer and an opportunity to ask for one thing. And Solomon asks for wisdom. And so God gave Solomon incredible wisdom. Now, Solomon did not always use that incredible wisdom, right? Just because you have wisdom, right, doesn't mean you'll use it. But God did give him great wisdom and great insight into life. And Solomon shared that wisdom and insight in, a, in, in, in writings ultimately to a son, but ultimately for us. We call it the book of Proverbs. And so if you have your Bible still open, I want you to turn to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Very familiar verses. Very familiar. But as we're thinking about what it means to seek God this week, as we think about what it means and looks like to be a God seeker, today I want us to think about what it means to seek God for direction in our lives. For our choices, for our decisions. How many of you have ever been in a moment of life where you've sort of felt paralyzed or, or stressed out about choices or decisions or direction for your life? Anybody? All right. If you haven't been, you will at some point. And so what I want us to consider today is, is what does God have to say about seeking Him for direction in our lives? And I want us to look at these familiar verses, but I also want us to look at how David lived these out in, Psalm, in 1 Samuel 24. And uh, then we'll make some thoughts for how we can apply that to our own life. So, let's read it together. Familiar verses, but let's read God's Word together. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not depend on your own understanding. Seek His will in all that you do, and He will show you which path to take. Seek His will in all that you do, and He will show you which path to take. So I want us just to break down because there's sort of three things that Solomon instructs us to do and then a promise that if we do those things we'll experience something. So the first thing he says is to trust in the Lord with all your heart. So when it comes to seeking God for direction in our lives, Solomon says the first thing that, that you and I need to do is to trust in the Lord with all of our heart. To trust God with our heart. Now what does that mean? Like, what does that practically mean? Well, it, that word there and that phrase, trust in the Lord, it, it literally pictured something of bowing down with all of your being. Right? This wasn't, this wasn't just, you know, you've, how many of you have had somebody tell you, hey, just trust me? Right? Anybody? 
When somebody tells you to trust them, what do you usually know not to do? <laughs> right? Because if they have to say it, right? Like if they have to try to convince you, there's a good, you've already had a good reason, right, not to what? To trust them. But when we talk about trusting in God, this isn't like, hey, just trust me. This, this picture here, the, the word, the language that's used here is a picture of submission. Right? This is a picture of submission. This is a picture of trusting God with my whole being, with all that I am. And so as we look at that truth, we would say that, and, and it's been quoted like this, that divine direction begins with unconditional submission. If, if I'm going to seek God for direction in my life, like if I want God's leading in my life, and how many of you would say, I, I want God's leading in my life? Anybody? All right, I hope you do. Right? I hope you do. If you want God's leading in your life, that begins by first saying, I must unconditionally submit to God. Right? Divine direction begins with unconditional submission. Now, here's the thing. That doesn't come naturally. Have you ever noticed that? Like it's not our natural inclination to completely submit to God. That sometimes we want to do our own thing, right? And we want to make our own plans and go our own way. And then we want to ask God to bless it, right? Have you ever made plans and then just said, God, I've made these plans to just let you know. And I'd really love you to bless them, but I'm going to do this, right? You see, that's not how it works if we really want direction from God. The first thing we have to say is, I must unconditionally submit to God. Here's the thing. We have the privilege of reading Proverbs in a greater way than even Solomon's son or the original readers would have read it, right? Because we get to read it in light of God's fuller revelation of Jesus, right? We get to read it in light of knowing that God sent his son into this world for us, right? We, we began this week by talking about relationship, that God initiated a relationship with us through his son, Jesus, who came to live for us, to die for us who rose from the dead, who ascended to the Father, and who's coming again one day in power and in glory. Right? And that God has offered you the privilege of knowing Him and living in relationship with Him. And that relationship is defined by His great love for you. And so this God who loves you enough to give His Son for you, this God who rescued you and redeemed you and didn't just forgive you, right, but gave you His Spirit, who adopted you into His family, who's promised you eternal life in His kingdom and His glory. That God asks you, would you trust me with your life? And we can all sit here today and say, yes, that's, that's rational, I should do that, but it doesn't always come natural. And so we must submit to God. God's unconditional love motivates us. David exemplified this. Right? David is our example. And in the cave, look at what he said. 1 Samuel 24, 6. David said to his men, he said, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master. Right? This is when they were saying, kill him. Kill him, right? He says, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is anointed of the Lord. See, it would have been easy to justify killing Saul in that cave, wouldn't it? How many say that would have been pretty easy to justify? Right? We, we're all familiar with justifying our actions, right? With convincing ourselves why it's okay to do something, even if we know it's not okay. His followers supported him. He had moral justification. He could have claimed self-defense, right? It would have been very easy for him to justify. But instead, he trusted God with his heart. Right? He submitted to God and said, God has anointed Saul to be king. He has anointed me to be the next king. But he hasn't removed Saul yet from being king. And I'm not going to do it. Right? I'm not going to put myself in the place of God and force this thing to happen. You know, sometimes when we're looking for direction in our lives, we, we try to force things. And David didn't force it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Divine direction begins with unconditional submission. You must come to a place and a posture where you submit yourself completely to God. Secondly, Solomon said, do not depend on your own understanding. Do not depend on your own understanding. Literally, this phrase means don't prop yourself up on your own understanding. How many of you have ever seen anything propped up and you looked at it and you thought, that's going to fall? Anybody? Alright, I, I found this picture in Fillmore the other day. No, just kidding. Not really in Fillmore. But um, how many of you think I would be safe to slide under that truck and work on it, right? Not so good. Uh, but that's really a picture, right? It's, it's like We all think that's crazy, that's redneck, that's whatever, right? But, but as much as we would say that's, that's, not, that's foolish, right? How many would you say that's, kind of, that's foolish? All right, that's foolish. But it's just as foolish, 
right? It's just as foolish to depend on our own understanding. To think that we're smart enough to know what is best for us. To think that we have all the wisdom that we need to make choices. Solomon says, don't prop yourself up on your own understanding. We need God's wisdom. So how do we get God's wisdom? Somebody help me out. How do we get God's wisdom? If we need wisdom for life, how do we get it? Where can we look? Yes. Ask. Ask? All right, absolutely. We can pray and say, God, I, I, I need your wisdom. for. I need your direction. I need some wisdom for this decision. Where else can we look? Yes. The Bible. The Bible. All right, we have God's Word, right? His living Word given to us, given for us. And in that, in, in God's Word, right, we get wisdom for life. We get divine direction. All right, what else? Maybe one other area. Yes. Fellow Christians. Fellow Christians, absolutely, right? Godly counsel, right, is often a great way to confirm. Is that because I've read the Bible, I've prayed, and now I want to confirm is this, is, is, did I read it correctly? Am I understanding it right? Don't prop yourself up on your own understanding. If you want to know God's will, read His Word, be in prayer, get godly counsel. Because here's the thing God's will for your life will never contradict His Word. Right? God's will for your life will never contradict His, his Word. And, and until we're willing to do what He already said, we shouldn't expect that He's going to show us something else. Does that make sense? Right? We shouldn't expect that, that God, God, show me what to do here, but I'm not even doing what He already said to do. Like I'm not even trusting Him with the instructions He's given me. God's will for your life will never contradict His Word. Don't depend on your understanding. David, again, is our example. All right, look at 1 Samuel 24, verse 12. Because God's will will never contradict God's word. 1 Samuel 24, 12. David speaking to Saul. He says, May the Lord judge between you and me. And may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. This is David saying, I'm not going to prop myself up on my own understanding. I'm not going to depend on, on, on what, what I think I should do. Right? I am going to get guidance from God's Word. I'm going to do it the right way. Right? I'm going to not trust my own wisdom. And so he says, he says, he says may God judge between you and me. Right? May God be our judge. And, and then I like what he says. He says, may the Lord avenge the wrongs that have been done to me. Right? David wasn't pretending that what Saul was doing was okay. Right? David wasn't pretending that, that, that this was not an evil thing that Saul was doing. He just says, I'm going to leave it in God's hands. Right? Trusting in, in the Lord and depending on my own understanding doesn't mean that I say that that thing didn't matter. That's not right. I'm just saying, I'm going to let my Father in Heaven handle it. Right? I'm going to let God handle this. And so he says, let, let the Lord avenge the wrongs you've done to me. He says, but my hand, right, my hand will not do it. Because David knew it was not his place right, to take out God's king. Because he also knew that if he takes out God's king, right, and then becomes king, what's he always going to be doing? Somebody help me out. Looking over his back. Looking over his back, Right? Right, you take the kingdom through killing the king, guess what you can probably expect, right? Someone else is going to get the same idea about you. So David trusted. He didn't prop himself up. The third thing, seek his will in all that you do. Seek his will in all that you do. We're to seek the will of God in every area of our life. Right? Every, God, is, God is interested in every aspect of your life. There's no part of your life that God does not want to be involved in. And there's no part of your life in which God does not want us to seek His will and His direction in that. And so I want to seek God in all my ways. I want to seek God in, in my dating ways. All right? not, not my dating ways, All right, because those days are over, thankfully. But you say, I want to, I want to seek God in my dating ways. I, I want to seek God in, in my education, in my school. Right? I, I, don't, I don't want to cheat. I don't want to, I don't want to do things that aren't of God. I want to seek God in my entertainment ways. I can seek God in my financial ways. I can seek God in my career path, my choices, friendships. In every way, God calls us to seek His will. This word here in your translation may be translated acknowledge. Right? In all your ways, acknowledge Him. Right, and he'll direct your paths. That word acknowledge or seek, to, however it's translated, it really just comes from a Hebrew word that means to know. Right, to know. And so, know or acknowledge his will. Right, seek his will. 
yield to His will. How do we do that? Well, it's through something that's painful to hear, right? And we're going to talk a little bit about it more tomorrow. But it's obedience. All right, how many of you just say the word obedience is painful? And it, how many of you feel pain when you hear the word obedience? All right, just a few. That's not bad. I'm probably one of those people. But obedience, obedience is how we seek His will. All right, we obey Him. We seek His will. When things aren't clear, we obey what He's already told us to do, where He's already spoken. Because here's something that I've learned. God's will for our life always has more to do with who we are than where we are. You know, so many times we are, we are so worried about, am I supposed to go here? Am I supposed to go there? Am I supposed to do this or that? And, 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 and those things are not unimportant. But, but God is much more concerned about who you are than where you are. He's perfectly able to get you from here to there. Right? You're not going to miss God's will. Right? God is more concerned about who you are than where you are. He's more concerned about shaping and forming your character than just getting you somewhere. And we see David again as our example. Look at 1 Samuel 24, 15. David said, May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. Again, speaking to Saul. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. Dave, David chose to put this situation in God's hands. Instead of, instead of seeking his will, he sought God's will. He put it in God's hands. He says, may the Lord be our judge. May God decide. Let me, his will be done. He says, may he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. I want God's will to be done. But I'm going to trust my Father in heaven. I'm going to trust his plans, his perfect timing for my life. Right? God wants to give you his direction in life. God wants us to know His direction and He's given us His Word to guide us and to lead us. He's promised us that He'll do that. I like the promise that He gives us. He will show you which path to take. Here's God's promise. If, if we will do what God has told us to do, right? If we, will, if we will seek to submit to Him in all areas of life, so God, I, I'm willing to unconditionally submit my life to you because, because that, no, that's the beginning of seeking your direction. And I'm, I'm, I'm willing not to prop myself up on my own understanding to think that I know it all, to think that I'm smart enough, to think that I can figure it all out, to think that I'm wise enough. But I, I'll seek your wisdom, God. I'll seek it in your word. I'll seek it in prayer. I'll seek it through wise counsel. God, I, I, will, I, will, I, will, not, I will not depend on my own understanding. I'll seek your will. In all that I do, then God says, He will show you which path to take. He'll make His will for your life clear. He will lead you and He will guide you. I've experienced that in my own walk with the Lord, and I have no doubt that if you'll do those things, that God will lead you faithfully and guide you. Here's the thing one day your life is going to tell a story. You know, we, we hear stories from our dads and our grandfathers. Right? We hear their life stories. We read life stories in God's Word. But one day your life is going to tell a story. And I really want you this morning to think about what story will your life tell? Because here's the thing. Some of the decisions and the choices that you make now as teenagers will affect the rest of your life and the rest of your story. And that doesn't mean that there isn't grace and forgiveness and, and God abundantly forgives it doesn't mean that if we mess up that God's plans for our life are over. Right? God loves taking our mess ups and making and taking them and weaving them into His plan. But the decisions and choices that we make do often have lifetime consequences. One day your life will tell a story. Now is the time to think about how do I want to launch out into that story? What do I want my story to be about? Do I want my story to be about I sought direction from the Lord. I sought guidance from Him. I unconditionally submitted my life to Him. I, I said, God, you can have my life. God, whatever you want to do, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, I'm willing to do that. I'm not going to prop myself up on my own understanding. I, I'm not going to be, I'm going to seek your wisdom. I'm going to acknowledge you. I'm going to seek you in all that I do. So I want to ask you this morning,
Are you seeking God for direction? Are you seeking God for direction? And if not, if not, would you commit? Maybe, maybe it'll be while you're here that, that you might leave this place when you go home and say, I, I, want to, I want to go a little bit of a different direction. I want to unconditionally submit my life to God. One of the things that God did in my life as a camper over my two summers was to bring me to a place where I began, and it was still a process after that, but I began to try to take my hands off of my life and off of my plans and off of my dreams and submit to His. Because God's plans for my life were different than my plans. But I, I can promise you that God's plans are infinitely better than your plans. Right? God can write a better story for your life than you ever could. You know, so many times we want to script our life story, right? We, we have an imagination. I want it to go like this, and I want it to go like that, and I want to do this, and I want to do that. And we think we know how to script our story. But I want to promise you, God can write a better story than you ever could. And you will never, ever regret, ever regret letting God write your story. I hope and pray that you will seek God for direction in your life. Trust in God with all of your heart. Submit to Him. Don't lean on your own understanding. Seek Him in all your ways. Obey Him. Would you let me pray for you this morning? Our Father in Heaven, I, I thank You for this new day that You've given us. And Father, I thank You for Your grace that once again is available to us. And Father, I pray uh, for each person here this morning, each student, Father, each counselor, each faculty member, each staff member, Father, for myself. Because Father, there isn't a one of us that does not need your guidance and your direction. And Father, I, I pray that, that if there are some that are wrestling with or struggling with being willing to submit to you and to trust you and to let go of control, Father, that today that you would help them to see how much you love them, how much you care for them, and how great your plans are for their life if they would just take their hands off of it. Father, I pray that you would forgive us for, for often propping ourselves up on our own understanding and thinking that we're smart enough or wise enough to make good choices. And Father, I pray that we would instead submit to your wisdom and seek your ways in your word, in prayer. And Father, I pray that we would trust you with all of our heart, that we would seek you, acknowledge you in every way. And God, I pray that you would then direct our paths so that you might be glorified in our lives and so that our lives one day might tell a story of your goodness, of your faithfulness, of your power, of your ability to use weak and foolish things for your glory. And Father, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.